Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Rebecca Levis here, and it's time for Torah. We're going to study Torah together. We're in the book of Leviticus, and actually in the Torah cycle, we're uh, around halfway through, and you can join us anytime to study Torah. It's the thing to do, you know. We're using this book, A Year Through the Torah, for Christians, and if you order it on Amazon, you can have it bound, and then when you're studying, it lays nice and flat on your desktop, like so. So I wanted to show you that workbook. Also, it's from um, John Parsons, and John Parsons has a fantastic website I want to um, tell you about. It's called Hebrew Number Four Christians.com. Hebrew Number Four Christians.com. If you go there, you'll find anything and everything you've ever wanted to know about the uh, Jewish people, their culture, and uh, their traditions, their feasts, the language itself. It's just a fantastic site. And that's where I began my Hebrew study was on that site. I learned my letters on that site. So anyway, I wanted to share that with you before we get started. Also, today, I want to remind everybody to continue to pray for our um, loved ones, friends and family who don't know Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah. And we have a box called our treasure chest. And in it, we have the names of Am Segula, God's treasured people. And inside, we have many little Torah scrolls with people's names on it who uh, don't know their Messiah yet. And so we, we pray for them weekly. And so I have this whole um, treasure chest full of people that I pray for, for them to come to know Yeshua. And this is the tree of life. Isn't this beautiful? One of the gals in my Torah class uh, designed this whole thing. Thank you, Mary Jane. So that is that. And uh, today we're going to be studying uh, the Levitical priesthood as well as the Moedim or God's appointed times. Many of you have asked me to um, do a whole thing just on the feasts, but if you go through the Torah cycle, it's going to cover every single one of them. So um, you're going to get everything just by going through the Torah with me. So I wanted to show you that today we're going to be um, talking about the Modim, the feasts, and I wanted to show you this book. It's called The Feasts of the Lord by Kevin Howard and Marvin Rosenthal. And I love this book. It's one of the first ones that I got teaching me about the feast. The reason I love it so much is they have these fantastic pictures in here um, for each of the feasts. And then they show you like the biblical um, observance of it, the service, what it looks like, um, the modern observance of it and um, what goes on in the synagogue when they have this service. And then they tie it into the fulfillment of that feast in the New Testament or the Brit Hadashah. So it's, it's so thorough and so wonderful. So um, I hope that you will invest in this. It's well worth, I think it's 24 bucks. So anyway, let's get started today and we'll share the screen and begin. So before studying Torah, the Jewish people pray a simple prayer. Let's say it together. It's in the blue. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher Kedishanu BeMisvotav Vitzevanu LaAsok BeDivrei Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the Universe, who sanctifies us with His commandments and commands us to busy ourselves or to meditate on the words of Torah. Amen. And that's exactly what we're going to do today. So let's begin this parasha or portion of scripture called Imor. Imor means to say or to speak. And we're in Leviticus 21, all the way through uh, chapter 24, 23. And then I'll be referencing some of the other scriptures in the prophets and uh, swing into the New Testament. So let me just give you a roadmap. Uh, I call it roadmap to redemption because we're going to be talking today about the feasts, which are a picture of the coming of the Messiah, the death of the Messiah, the resurrection of the Messiah, and his second return. So the spring feasts and the fall feasts are all a picture of the two comings 
of the Messiah. And today we're going to be looking a little bit at the priesthood. I'm not going to go into a lot of the things on sacrifices because we've done that for the last three teachings. I'll just quickly go through that. But we are going to talk about the Sabbath and the feasts. And uh, mainly that's what I'm going to focus on today. And then the, in the New Testament, the reference is 1 Peter 2, 4 through 10. So before we get started, what is the priesthood and where did it come from? So let's review because there's a lot of people who are just joining us for the first time. So we have to begin at the beginning, which is Abraham had three sons. The patriarchs of the, the Jewish people are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. One of them was Levi. And it's not Levi as in genes. It's Levi. And Levi was chosen after the fall of Israel into the sin of the golden calf because the firstborn usually gets the right um, to be the priest of the home. Reuben, because he was part of the dancing around the golden calf, forfeited that. And Moses came down and said, who is going to stand with me for God? And the Levi and his people were the first to go join Moses. So the priesthood was then taken from Reuben as the priest and given to Levi. So Levi then had three sons, Merari, Kohath, and Gershon. And then through Kohath came Amran. He was one of four sons. Amran was the father of Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. And it was through Miriam, I mean, through Aaron, that the priesthood would come. And Aaron um, was given that by God. Um, and it would be him who was given then the right to be the high priest or to offer the actual sacrifices within the temple. So there were Levites who had just regular jobs within the temple. And then they had the high priest who came through Aaron and his sons. And they were to be the ones that did all of the service or the avodah in the temple. So that's the breakdown. And his line are called the Kohanim. The Kohanim, you've heard of the name Kohen. Well, if anybody has that name, Kohen, then they're part of the priesthood um, of Israel. Then there's a subset um, of the Levitical regular priests. So. It's a lot to remember, but here's the breakdown in case you've forgotten. We went over this a little bit at the beginning in um, Exodus, so I'm not going to spend time on it now. So Parasha Imor begins with Adonai speaking to Moses. The temple has been set up, the sacrifices have been defined, and now he's going to speak just to the priesthood, to the Levites. And here's what he said, speak Amar. And that's where you get this word, Amar, Amar, it's right here. Speak to the sons of Aaron. Now, this word is interesting here. Normally, the word to speak or to say in the um, Bible is the word debar, to speak or to say, which means just to tell them something. But Amar is used here because it means to speak tenderly or softly to. So it's, it's a gentle command, as if um, it's done out of love and tenderness and, a, and an intimate relationship. So here's what he says, no man is to make himself unclean. Now he's talking to the sons of Aaron, who are the high priesthood. No one is to make himself unclean. In other words, there's a responsibility that comes with being part of the priesthood. This was followed by several rules regarding who they could marry, uh, what they could come in contact with, and a lot of informa information and details about the actual feast days. So God's words to his people, to the priesthood, were not just strict laws given by this rigid lawmaker, but they were spoken with a deep and abiding love. And so if we're to be his followers, and if we're called a royal priesthood, 
Then when we speak to others, our words should be in kindness and in love and in gentleness. And we see this all over the New Testament where Paul, Rabbi Shaul, admonished people as well as the other apostles to be at peace with all people and to, to not slander and to um, be gentle in how we speak and to don't repay evil for evil, but good instead. So all this comes from wanting to uh, represent the priesthood. So the Adonai had the same kind of love for us, and now we're to pass it on through um, being his representatives. And um, he wanted the people of Israel not to come in contact with anything unclean. The reason was, is because that close, intimate, tender relationship would be broken if they came into things that were unclean. And it, they would become defiled, and therefore the relationship would suffer. And that's the main picture here that he begins with, is he didn't want the relationship between him and his priesthood to suffer. Because if that suffered, then it trickled down to the people. So you can see, if people representing Yeshua now, the royal priesthood, if that relationship breaks down, then it affects those around us. And there's a responsibility that goes with this. So his desire for them was to know him and to know him intimately. And this would require them drawing near in worship. The priests were the mediators, don't forget, between God and the people. So they would provide the means by which the people could draw near to God. So if they became unclean, then the people could not draw near either. Now look at the word for draw near. It's the word for offering. And it's the word korban. It comes from the verb karav, kof, resh, vet. And karav means to draw near. So the, the V and the B in Hebrew are the same letter right here. So you get korban here with a B, but it's karav, V sound when it's in its verbal form. <coughs> so you might be wondering, why that's a little bit different. So the tabernacle was the place where they would draw near in this covenant relationship with God and have a unique oneness. Why? Because in that oneness, in that intimacy, then they were to reproduce and sustain new spiritual life. So you see, it is the same in a marriage covenant where the two become one in order to reproduce and sustain life in the spirit realm, the priesthood was the mediator that brought the two together, God and his people, so that spiritual life could be reproduced. So the bride and groom are equal in this marriage covenant. And so when we unite ourselves to the son, Jesus, we become equal in that we are considered righteous, just like he is. No, not equal to as far as the Godhead goes, but we're equal in righteousness when we're intimate relationship with the Messiah. So bride and groom are always equal in value, but have different roles, just like the Messiah had his role, and then we unite to him, and then we have our role, which is to be the light in the darkness. So in this world, so they're unique, yet their purpose is different. So we see this principle even in the creation. Um, just a couple nights ago, it was the super moon. And I walked out in the morning, and it was just still huge in the sky. And then I looked over and here comes the sun. So I'm like, Oh, Lord, that's the two witnesses. The Bible says, as long as the sun and moon remain, that's how long my people will remain. So the sun and the moon are the two witnesses in the sky. And the two of them function as one, as the luminaries in the sky. The sun by day and the moon by darkness. You see, if we come about as the moon, we represent the moon, by the way. The people of God have no light of their own. It's only we're in the right relationship with the sun that we take on light. 
And so it's when we are in the right relationship with the S-O-N that we begin to take on his light and then we're used in the dark world. You see that principle? So just as the sun and moon were luminaries for the day and the night, so then same principle goes with the seed and the soil. The two of them come together to produce new life, uh, which is the fruit. And then in the fruit is more seed and it just keeps going and going and going in cycles, just like the sun and the moon keep rising and setting and rising and setting in a cycle. That's how Hebrews taught. Everything is cyclical. It's not past, like now we're new and progressive. No, we just keep doing the same cycle in righteousness. So the feast days function as a cycle within cycle of a year. And that's how Hebrew works. So you need to know about the cycles. You need to get this book. All right. Matter of fact, when I got that book, I sent it to all my siblings for Christmas. So this oneness that they're talk, talking about here, this unity, meant that they shared the same priorities, the same goals, and the same purpose. Now, the Bible speaks about this as being equally yoked in a covenant relationship. So if we're equally yoked, then that means that we're going in the same direction, right? Like you can't yoke a donkey and an ox because an ox wants to do the work and, and is meant to plow and to, to move forward and to, to be producer of the field. And the donkey is stubborn and it wants to just sit in one place. And so you're going to have to drag unwillingly this donkey if you're united to a donkey or an you have to be equal. You put another ox next to you and you'll be the same in priorities goals, and purpose. See how that works? So if God wants to bring his bride out to the promised land, then he wants to transform her by showing her his love. And he wants her to continually draw near because it's in that relationship that, that more spiritual seed is reproduced. Now, this is the same principle in the New Testament when it says, do not forsake the gathering together, because it's there that we share intimacy with one another and with God. Oh, I was so glad to get back to worship uh, when our church opened up the outdoor worship. And so um, that's a, a principle, a harvest principle. Remember at the very beginning in Genesis when I was doing the teaching on how everything in our Bible is related back to things we can see, taste, touch, and smell, that God uses those things in our body and in the environment around us to relate so that people everywhere on every continent could relate to the God of Israel because everybody has a body and everybody can relate to their physical surroundings. That's how Hebrew teaches. And I love that. And it's all around harvest time that these feasts were first begun. So it's in the willingness of the people to draw near that this love of God can be best demonstrated. Isn't that what marriage is? The consummation is where it's best demonstrated. And then what comes from that new life? So this love then could be shared with others, with your neighbors or with strangers in your midst. This was the purpose. And this was the purpose of then multiplying God's love. Now, we hear a lot about that today. It's all in the name of love. As long as you love, then that's all that matters. Well, that's not how God teaches love. Love has restrictions and responsibilities. And it's not void of borders. It's not void of context and con, um, covenant. So you have to think about love in that context. There's things I love, but there's things that are not appropriate for me to love. Like, like we talked about that last week. Like I can love my dog, but it's not appropriate for me to have sex with my dog. It's in the marriage covenant, man and female, that new life is brought forward. And that is a godly principle. So unity is, has, has boundaries and restrictions, right? And so the purpose is to bring forth life, not just 
love. So it is to give them value or to meet the needs. That's why we give love to people. We give them value, we meet needs, and we give love because everybody has this void and it's an emptiness and it's painful to be alone. Man isn't meant to be alone. So in giving love, we want to draw near to others so they'll want to draw near to God. And that's the, the cycle, you see. And so this acts of kindness that we give in love is to our fellow man. What? So that they can say how wonderful we are? No. It's not to lift us up, these acts of kindness. It's to point them to the one who loves them best. And that's why in the New Testament, it says, don't, you know, if you give or if you love or if you do kindness, you know, don't go into the town square and announce it to everybody. You don't need your name on a plaque in the lobby of your church um, because you gave. It's to be in secret, Jesus said, to give in secret because your father in heaven then rewards you. So um, the only reason perhaps that we might share that is to teach our children how to give. And I'm in the process of watching my own uh, son and his wife teach their kids how to have some for you, some for God, and some for others. And so it's the three in one, giving. I like that principle. So the real purpose in loving other is to do it in God's name so that they can come to know him. So when they experience this love mingled with our compassion for them, then they too will want to draw near. Love always draws you closer. If you're not being drawn to something, you're being repelled against it. And so um, it's important to love in compassion and to speak tenderly to the ones you love. So it brings around healing, ultimately, both physically and spiritually to all people. And that was why Jesus came. Now, they were foreshadowed in the Moedim, or these feasts, which I'm going to get into in just a minute. So the redemption can be seen in these seven main feasts called the Moedim. And Moed means uh, an appointment or, or a time to, to witness something. It, it stems from the word ed, which is a witness. So the means by which you witness something, you add an M on the front of the word ed and you get Moed. So God arranged specific dates that he would meet with his bride, Israel. And there were seven of them. And it coincides with their feast days. And so it was like God had this appointment book with his favorite female date. And okay, so if you just start dating somebody and you, they said, let's meet you know, on these random dates, then you would go, if you really love that person, if you really wanted to draw near, you would go and maybe circle them in red on your calendar so you wouldn't forget, right? So the Moedim is like God has these appointments with his bride. And this word, Moed, has another word related to it, which means a da. A da means to adorn something. So when you're drawing near, you're adorning one another with words of love. And um, this is why you adorn yourself in a, in a marriage covenant. It's this beautiful picture of two coming together and witnessing love before God. And that's all in the word moed. And then the, the plural is just moedim. That's plural. So wanted to show you where that word came from. Now let's look at the feasts of the Lord. There's seven Moedim or appointed times when God would meet with his people. Some are more major and some are less um, important in God's mind. But in ancient Israel, there were three times out of the year that every Hebrew male was to go up and worship in the temple 
um, on specific times. And it was these three here starred times. So beginning, middle, and end. And that's significant, by the way. So let's review what these feasts are. There were four spring feasts. And remember, this is all related to the harvest time. So it was Passover or Pesach in Hebrew, unleavened bread or Hag HaMatzot, the matzah is the bread, first fruits or HaBikarim, Pentecost or Feast of Weeks or in Hebrew Shavuot, Shav Shavuot comes from the word Sheva, which means seven, because we're counting up seven um, seven cycles of seven. I'm going to get to that in a minute. Then in the fall, the fall harvest, these, this was the spring harvest here, and here's the fall harvest, and it begins with the Feast of Trumpets or blowing, and it's called Rosh Hashanah. Now it's the Jewish New Year, and then the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, and the final feast, the Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot in Hebrew. So these are the foot feasts where you were to walk up to Jerusalem and to um, celebrate these feasts, all males. And so um, this is an exact picture on the menorah, by the way, and it pictures the cycles of seven. Seven meaning complete. Remember that? We talked about that. So there's seven of these feasts. Now, from the second day of Passover, counting up to um, Shavuot is a 49 day uh, counting period. And it's seven, time, uh, seven weeks of seven. So you get the Feast of Weeks. That's where you get Pentecost. Now, Penta means 50. So from the time you start counting, there's 49 days from the second day of Passover up until this feast is the 50th day. So that's where um, Shavuot comes from is seven sevens, the 49 days of counting up. That's the cycle we're in currently. Did you know that? And it's called the counting of the Omer. So we're going to get into that in a minute. Um, the counting of the Omer, or these 49 days, started this year, March 28th, and it ends May 16th. And today, on this Shabbat, it's actually the 35th day of the counting of the Omer. And again, um, I just put this picture in here so when you get your PowerPoint, you'll have that information there. Uh, regarding this wonderful book that I shared. So after the spring feast of first fruits, there's the 49 day count up to the feast of Shavuot. This is called the counting of the Omer. Omer is a uh, sheath, counting of the sheath. Now, sheath, sheath, sheath. <laughs> I'm, I'm blanking now. The counting of the sheaves. Yeah, sheaves. Okay, so it's called Sifrat HaOmer, the counting of the sheaves. Now, it's also known as Pentecost because Penta means five, and there's the 50th day. That's where you get five, 50th. So today um, is not the 31st. I said it is the 35th. This was from uh, a slide I took from last year, so I'm going to change that to 31st, 35th. Um, that should be TH. I might as well correct it while I'm here. Okay, so I already told you what it meant. It's also, did you know that this 50th counting on the 50th day of Shavuot, it's considered Israel's wedding day. It's also the day that they were given the Ten Commandments. So he brought the bride out from the, the oppression of Egypt to the mountain to worship and come together as bride and groom. Remember that? And then when, when he came down with the Ten Commandments, that's when she was dancing around with another man, another religion, 
the golden calf. And that's when the Levites sided with Moses and all, all the rest were um, given a period of um, repentance. So it's interesting that during this 49 days of counting, it's a time for people to reflect on their own character. How am I treating others? And how am I responding to the character of God in my life. So there's a prayer and things that are said on each day in the synagogue. And um, just know that this is an important time for the Hebrew people um, to celebrate then Shavuot. So they were given um, these empowerments, the Ten Commandments, of course, to help the bride walk out her new responsibilities as a bride. That is exactly what the Holy Spirit was poured out on to help us have the power then to walk it out as the bride of Messiah. So do you see those two are paralleled and Messiah um, was shown in each one of these. It was, I'm going to go back, it was here that the Messiah was crucified. He was in the grave on unleavened bread, the sinless sacrifice. He rose from the dead here, and then he ascended into heaven in this period, and then he's returning on his second coming on the Feast of Trumpets. This will be the judgment day, and then once that happens, this will be his final kingdom on earth where he has the wedding supper of the lamb. So this represents, the spring feast represents his first coming and all that he that was accomplished. And then this represents his second coming. And it is in the fall when the harvest is final and everything is bundled up and the wheat goes into the barn and everything that the, the farmer didn't plant, the weeds will also be bundled up and cast into the fire. And that's exactly what is shown in the New Testament when Jesus talked about the end times. And the end times began, by the way, when Jesus was the first coming. Everything from his death, resurrection, and ascension from that point on are considered the last days. We're in them. We've been in them. But we're to pay attention to what Jesus described as birth pangs, where he said that things will increase in intensity, just like birth pangs in a woman's labor before the final um, uh, baby is born. That is what is going to be going on in history. There's going to be increase in climate things. There's going to be an increase in knowledge. There's going to be um, a parting of good and evil where things that were considered evil are now good and things that were considered good are now considered evil. And it said that man will be faithless, senseless, ruthless, and heartless. And we see these things going on in every nation right now. So we are in the birth pang days. So this is why Christians are paying attention to what's going on in the Middle East and in our culture, because these are all signs and symptoms of his coming, just like there's signs and symptoms of a birth of a baby. So I want to go back and show you that real quick. So the counting of these Omer was to begin um, the second evening of Passover. I already said that. This counting um, came from the barley harvest. And here it is. Omar literally means sheep. Now, the first of the barley harvest was then brought in to the um, temple. And then the wheat harvest was brought in on Shavuot. So if this was, uh, the Lord was faithful to bring the rains in the early harvest, then he'd also be faithful to bring rain for the final harvest. And so this is, like I said, a beautiful picture. So in ancient times, uh, everything centered around the harvest time and everything centered around rain. Rain is critical. If you've been to Israel, then you understand what I'm talking about. Without rain, without God's blessing, everything's just dust and, and dirt and dark brown. 
And it's so interesting when we went to northern Israel, right on the Golan Heights, and we were right there at the Syria, the border of Syria, you could look and see everything was dark and brown. And then you looked the other direction on Israel and everything was green and lush. It was the contrast of God's blessing and favor on the people of Israel versus right there in Syria. And uh, it's interesting that that is the same today when you go there. So rain is also critical. And it's shown that God sends rain when there's favor. And the Bible says his word falls like rain. So these harvest um, feasts were the people asking God to bless them with rain for their crops. Without rain and without crops, there's no food. Without no food, there's death. And that's what we're seeing right now, also multiplied around the world, is death and famine and no rain. And you can say it's global warming. Some of it is warming of the planet. But why? Why is the planet changing so quickly? Has man been responsible and caring for what God gave them? Not so much. So um, there's, there's multiple things happening. So anyway, when they brought these wave offerings, this first portion, the barley, to the temples as an offering, that's saying in their hearts, I offer you the first of what I have now, trusting that you will meet my needs in the future. And that's exactly what we do when we come draw near to worship, is we're thanking God for what he's already giving us knowing that he's going to give us things in the future. And they would bring him in and they'd wave him front, back, side, as if he's saying um, symbolically, this waving is that God is going to take care of us at every direction. And we're going to shake off doubt in not having God meet our needs at every turn. Now, that is spiritual growth, isn't it? So it relates to the agricultural cycle. We cycle through times when there's great abundance, but also when we have little. And we're to be um, thanking God in all of these seasons of our lives, when there's abundance or when there's little. And Rabbi Shaul knew this principle very well. Paul said, you know, be content in whatever, whatever shape you're in. He says, I've been in content when I've had lots when I've had nothing, uh, when I've been persecuted, and when I've been um, honored and humbled. And so there's, there's this mindset that we get when we're spiritually mature that doesn't depend on what we see going on in this direction horizontally. It's having faith that God is faithful no matter what. And that's all related to rain and God's word being put right here. So since God was faithful in the early harvest or the barley harvest, then he would also remain faithful later. And isn't this also a picture of Jesus' first coming in the spring? Like the barley harvest, he will be faithful then to accomplish what he promised here in the end. And if all of this came true exactly to the day, to the day that the Messiah came was in the grave, resurrected third day, rose from the dead, went back to heaven, Shavuot, spirit poured out. All these things happened exactly on their feast days. So we can believe that Jesus, when he said the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, it'll be the trumpet right here, the trumpet call of God, and then the judgment. So it's appointed man to die once, and then the judgment. It's not reincarnation. You just keep coming back. It's appointed for man to die once. But if you have Jesus, you'll only die once. You'll never die spiritually because that will be resurrected with our body when he returns here. And so you want to be born twice in order to only die once. If you're only born once, you'll die twice, physically, and then the second death here, when that final harvest will bundle up those who rejected the Messiah, and they'll be thrown in a lake of fire. That's what the New Testament says, and that's the truth.
So I speak it in love and tenderness to tell you that every time there's a judgment, God first gives a warning. Some will have ears to hear, but some will turn their backs and laugh and mock and scoff. Remember on the cross when Jesus hung there, the mocker was on one side and the man of faith was on the other. And again, it's a picture of those two seed lines that is talked about in the very first gospel message in the Garden of Eden, when God said that the two seeds, one would, breathe, uh, one would step on the head of the seed of the serpent and that the seed of the serpent would bruise the heel of the seed of the woman. And that was the first gospel message right there, but pictured in this beautiful pattern of the feast days. So it's important to look at that. Now, I wanted to show you um, another, uh, let's see, where am I? Here I am. Okay, so the Kohanim had strict rules about being clean, tame, and being unclean when they offered these. And it goes into all this detail about um, who they can marry, who they can't marry, um, how God made sure that the natural family was taken care of um, within the priesthood. But if it didn't apply to their natural family, they were not to be in touch with anything of death because death was an abomination to God. Death was never meant to be. Man was meant to live eternally. But when they sinned in the garden and they listened to a different voice, then spiritually they died. And from then on, everyone who was born of Adam and Eve were dead spiritually. This is an abomination. And Jesus came to flip that on its head, to conquer death, because with death came decay. Now, think about this. Did you know eternal does not mean a long, 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 long time? Eternal mean an absence of death and decay. So within time, without time, there is no death and decay. But the moment they sinned, tick, 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 time began. Did you know the most accurate time clock in the universe is the radioactive time clock because it is a time clock based on decay. So this decay of the universe and the, um, the breakdown is continuing and that's time. But in eternity, there will be no time because there'll be no death or decay. So Jesus came to conquer that and to um, stop that from happening eternally. And that's what he did when he died in our place. And he conquered death and he rose from the dead. And all who believe in him will stand in his shadow, his righteousness, when that judgment day comes. And you don't want to be standing in your own righteousness. Trust me. What are you going to ask for on judgment day? Do you want God to be just and fair? Or do you want him to be merciful? and gracious. Those will be your two options. And it's like this. This is justice and righteousness will be the plumb line. And if you're going to stand in your own goodness, you'll never stand. It's only when you add the arms of the cross, grace and mercy, arms extended to you and I, that you receive that gift as the gift of salvation. And we will then stand in his shadow and God will look at us and he'll say, I only see Jesus. I don't see Rebecca Levis and her sin. That's been erased. It's gone as far as the East is from the West. Thank God for that. So he, I'm not going to go into all these rules. I'm going to trust that you can read this for yourself. And now I want to do some fun things with Hebrew because I know there's a lot of Hebrew students now watching this Torah cycle. So now for a little grammar. This counting of the Omer, this means to bundle together. Omer means a sheaf. And it means to, to bundle together as one. And this is exactly what's going to happen in the last harvest, right? It's a picture of bundling the wheat. So look at the word Omer comes from a sound-alike word, except it has a different first letter. 
So remember when I said if they share two letters, they're going to be related in some way. So when the two are coming together to function as one, it's the same word as to speak or to speak tenderly to. That brings you together. See how these words are related? Remember I said speak to the sons of Aaron and they're to count the Omer, Omar. It's related. And get this. Emer, Emer means the bough of a tree, the very top. And you know, the bough of a tree gives the tree its voice. When the ruach, the wind, goes through the leaves and they rustle, it gives the tree its voice. It's speaking. And that's the top of a bough of a tree. In scripture, people are often compared to trees. So the wind, when it unites with the leaves, gives it its voice. Just like when our lungs unite with our vocal cords, we get a voice. So it's the two working as one. This is a principle all through nature. And it's pictured in this um, beautiful comparison of these words as well. And then a phonetic uh, cognate or a sound alike word is um, what I'm talking about here. And only Aaron's um, lineage could perform, perform this service in the tabernacle to bring the people near. I wanted to show you some more cognate words. Um, that you can put in your special Hebrew book. It's the word for service, which is avad. Avad means to serve. And look at what this avad means when you just change one of the letters. Avad, avad. If you switch this letter for an aleph, it means to perish. So, Look at the difference here. You switch one letter and it flips it upside down. And do you know what? Our element of the universe, the elements, you know, the, um, the uh, what do you call that table? Oh, I'm having a blank. You know what I mean? Where all the elements have the positives and negatives. Um, the language works very similar to this. Um, you just change one thing and it's not acceptable anymore. And I'm like, oh my goodness, you can either serve God or you'll perish. Wow. In these two words. Here's where you find these words, service and perish, in your etymological dictionary, which is what we use here in our Hebrew class. Um, and you can purchase this too if you want to look up your own words. And then look at the word to draw near. Remember I said it means an offering, kor korban or karav? Well, look, if you just change the first letter again, it means to cover. Now, this can be in a negative way because you can either draw near in intimacy or you can cover up in shame. And the beauty of this is Jesus took our shame, and the day of atonement is the day of covering. So the one who is innocent died for the people of shame and covered our sin. Isn't that beautiful in these two words? So these are words you're going to want to put in your book, and here's where to find them in your dictionary. I wanted to show you an example of that. Um, like, oh, the chemical elements, that's what it is, dir. So look at uh, two hydrogen and an oxygen gives us water. It's drinkable. It's, it's, it's acceptable. But if you add just one oxygen molecule and you change it, you get hydrogen peroxide. Undrinkable, unthinkable. So see, all you do is change it and modify it and it becomes a different element. This is how people work with DNA to mutate this is how cells work when they mutate and they add or take away from, and it suddenly gets mutated and it morphs and, and metastasizes. This is how cells work. So Jesus said, don't add to my word, 
don't take away from my word. Why? Because there's truth in the words and in the letters themselves. That's what's so amazing about the Hebrew language and why I love it so much. So the, the high priest was to bring these offerings. Here it is, draw near, korban. They were to bring the grain offerings along with animal sacrifices. So you see, whenever you saw the grain and the animal sacrifice coming together, you'd have peace and they'd have this intimacy. And these are the three in one, the, the grain offering, the meat offering, and the, sin, and the peace offering are pictured right here. Do you remember the story of Cain and Abel where it said that they were to bring their offering and Cain was a man of the field and the field represented the world. So he brought just grain, but Abel brought both. First, he brought a, an animal and then the rabbis say, then he offered the grain in order to have peace. But Cain didn't have peace with God and Abel did. So Abel killed him. They uh, in the uh, Talmud, it actually states that Cain took a large rock and killed Abel with a stone. And in the end, hundreds of years later, Cain died when his house caved in on him and he stones hit his head. Very interesting. It's called a curse for a curse. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. So the very first murder was Cain who didn't bring the right sacrifice. Same today, the sacrifice is Messiah. He gave himself for the whole world and you can either receive it or reject it. It's up to you, but you've been told. Now you have a responsibility to either believe it and receive it or to reject it and to mock. And that spirit is going on in the world. So it would be the two functioning as one, the grain and the animal sacrifice to bring peace. So the blood of the innocent animal, the giver, the, the one coming with the sacrifice, his heart, that giver's heart, then would unite with God's heart through the blood of this innocent animal. And the priest is the one that would bring the bread and the grain and the blood. So as the royal priesthood were to bring the blessing of the Messiah to bring peace to other people, and that is our acceptable act of worship. So there's two words in Hebrew I want to show you that mean one, to come together as one. Now, it's the word ichad, and it means a unique unit or one of several combined. So that kind of unit is a composite unity. Like um, you can have one cluster of grapes, but there's many grapes that make up the cluster. It's the same kind of oneness. And then you have um, uh, yahid, which is a unique or solitary one. So a yahid is different from uh, Echad, even though they share two of the same letters. See the Het and the Dalet, the Het and the Dalet, but it's two different things. Um, so this means composite unity, this means singleness. So Yahid means to bind together into one. So each of us, all believers, will be bound together as Echad, one in Messiah. And there's a related word to um, the word echad, echad. Echad is a sound alike word to another word, which also means to bind together as one. And it's the binding of Isaac. When he bound Isaac on the wood, it's called the achida. See, echad, and it, they just add a hay on the end. But it's this word here, to bind together as one, is related to this oneness. So it's the animal sacrifice bound to the wood that's a related word. And isn't that exactly the picture of Yeshua bound to the tree? 
that would be the acceptable sacrifice? Wow. It's shown together over and over and all that the Jewish people celebrate and what happened during the binding of Isaac by the father of their faith, Abraham. So this is critical. Abraham is the father of all of our faith, both Jew and Gentile alike. And so remember, we're bound to the tree of Israel. We are the wild branches. It said some of the natural branches were broken off and we, the wild branches, were grafted in to the tree of faith. We both have Abraham as our father, but they missed their Messiah. But I'm showing you that pattern of the Moedim so you can see it represents his first and second coming. So I wanted to make that clear here. So the Torah, his word, plus the Holy Spirit that gets deposited in us work together as one. So it's by knowing his word and in the, the confirmation of the spirit is how we then walk out and live truth. But it has to be the two working as one. God's spirit in us along with his word. No spirit, no God's word. You're all on your own. It's man on his own that will be ruthless, faithless, senseless, heartless, rude, crude, unacceptable. That's it. Now look, here's another unity. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is my Lord, and believe in your heart, which means the Spirit's making me speak of Jesus, then you'll be saved. For it's with the heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth then that you confess it and are saved. So that's why it says in the New Testament, if you don't confess me before the world, men, then I will not confess you before my Father because I'll never have known you. Remember, Jesus said in the last days, many say, well, well, there'll be many saying, oh, Lord, you know, we did all these things in your name. But he'll say, I never knew you. It's that intimacy of knowing someone versus intellectually knowing of that person, tipping your hat and giving them honor versus having intimacy and communion. Again, covenant relationship as in marriage. So it's when God comes together with me that I have a composite unity. God is spirit in me. Okay, so if we confess and believe that we're justified, Jew and Gentile, acceptable. Call on, trust in the name, no shame. Heart and voice working together in worship. Love and gratitude of the heart means blessing. Blessing us and blessing others. So these are all the principles of the two working together as one. So Yeshua referred to himself as the bridegroom, as if he was saying, I'm God and you're the, the bride. So Jesus' disciples asked uh, Yeshua, why don't your disciples fast? And you know how he answered? He said, why would they fast? See, the bride always fasts waiting for her bridegroom in that culture. But Jesus said, why, why should they fast? The bridegroom's already here. Wow. So currently, the, the, the groom, the chatan, and the bride, the kala in Hebrew, they're engaged. So when Jesus came the first time, he gave us the Holy Spirit as if that's the wedding ring, the sign. And then when he comes a second time, it's the marriage supper of the Lamb referred to in Revelation 19, 7. You can read it yourself, which is the consummation where the two become one, echad one in body, mind, spirit, and one in his kingdom. And that's it. I can't say it any clearer. So the bride plus the, the groom equals marriage covenant. And then the final supper with the Messiah will be in our eternal home. You see, what did Jesus say before he left to his disciples? I go to prepare a place for you. And that's exactly what the bridegroom does. So God is that perfect matchmaker or Shad Khan. He set up 
as his bride, a match for us made in heaven. That's the Messiah. Jesus said, you didn't choose me, I chose you. John 15, 16 says, Yeshua chose us before the foundation of the earth. Wow. He knew whose heart would be open when the spirit calls. And that's found in Ephesians 1, 4. So 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 says, Yeshua chose us as first fruits from the dead in order to believe and receive the Holy Spirit. So once again, look, he chose us as first fruits. He rose on this feast of first fruits. Now we, because the spirit then is placed in us, then we are the first fruit of the spirit and we are born again and given that spirit. And it was poured out the Holy Spirit on their feast of Shavuot. There it is. So again, I wanted to just reiterate that. So now um, let's look into the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah, Galatians 3, 26 through 29. And let me just make sure I didn't skip a slide. No, I didn't. Okay. So uh, in Yeshua, so in Yeshua HaMashiach, in Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized the Spirit, and then externally, which is a proof of what's going on here, all who were baptized on Shavuot into the Messiah have clothed yourself with his righteousness. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you're all bundled in as one, echad, in Yeshua the Messiah. If you belong to the Messiah, then you are whose seed? Abraham's seed. Remember, the early harvest and now heirs according to the promise, what's coming for the fall har harvest. See, the later harvest. All this is talked about in the New Testament. If you understand what they're talking about as it relates to agriculture and the feasts of God, the Moedim. Look at feast 1 Peter 2, 4 through 10. As you come to him, the, they compare this now to a home or a stone. Um, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by some people, but chosen by God and precious to him, you yourselves now are living stones. And let me make that clear. We're built together, Ichad, as a spiritual house to be what? Priests, a royal priesthood like the Le Levitical priesthood, set apart for God to offer what? Spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Messiah. Now to you who keep trusting, he's precious. But to those who reject him, the very stone that the builders rejected, Israel rejected, has become the chief cornerstone. The chief cornerstone is the most important one. And I did a little background on um, cornerstones, and I just wanted to share this before I close. Um, did you know that the ceremony typically involved this placing of the cornerstone? In the ancient times when they had an important building, they would bring offerings of grain and wine and oil, and they would anoint the cornerstone. Look at this. It's a picture of the Pesach, the Last Supper, where he had the bread and the wine and um, he, the anointing of the Spirit. All this is a picture of what they did on the cornerstone. And it was symbolic of um, this building representing God's blessing on whatever it was they were building. And so sometimes um, it was put under the stone. And these were symbolic of the produce and the people of the land. And it was a means of their uh, subsistence. This in turn derived from the practice still performed uh, in some cultures um, of making animal sacrifices that were laid under this cornerstone. 
Now here's an ancient quarter, cornerstone I found and they put writing on it, which means this is what it's symbolizing. And sometimes they, in modern Greek culture, when the foundation of a new building is laid, it's custom to kill a cock or a ram or a lamb and to let its blood flow onto the foundation stone under which the animals afterwards buried. Did you know that in Greece? The object of the sacrifice is to give strength and stability to the building itself, you and I. Again, the Messiah is that chief cornerstone, anointed, the oil, the bread and the wine. And written on our hearts is his word and his spirit placed in us. And another interesting thing, it says that Sometimes instead of killing an animal, the builder would entice the man to whom it was dedicated to come and they'd measure his shadow. Isn't that interesting? They'd secretly measure the shadow or a part of it and then bury that measurement under the foundation stone. Oh my goodness, the man's shadow was buried under. We stand in the shadow of the Messiah. And that is under the cornerstone. Oh my goodness, I almost fell over when I read all this. So, so amazing. So in conclusion, all these feasts, sacrifices, priestly functions, all points to the Messiah who came to earth to heal and redeem this broken world. So the counting of this period we're in right now is always done, interestingly, in the night. Did you know that the counting of the days come in the nighttime because Israel's first day of freedom came during the darkest moment of their lives. And he led them out at night as a bright pillar of fire. And Jesus does the same today. He brings us his truth. That truth is a revelation of light. And then we're brought out of the darkness. So during this time of year in Israel, did you know that ultra-Orthodox Jews migrate to this northern town in Upper Israel near Golan Heights to a town of Moron? And they celebrate this feast of Lag Be'omer. It's the 33rd day of the counting of these 49 days. Why the 39? Lag stands for the two letters um, that add up to 33. And you go, well, why? I don't get what, what are they celebrating? Well, the Lamed stands for number 30, and the Gimel is the third letter, so it's number 33. It's a bittersweet celebration, and that is exactly what it is when we celebrate the Messiah, by the way. In the first century, the most well-known rabbi was Rabbi Akiva. And he was the chief contributor to the writing of the Mishnah, the oral law. And he had 24,000 students. And do you know they all died of a plague on the 33rd day of the counting of this 49-day period? So this 33rd day of the counting is like a minor holiday called Lag Be'omer. And it's on this night that they all go to this town in Moron and they light fire and have huge bonfires to symbolize the stopping of that plague. And, it, and it, it's symbolic to being brought out of the darkness by the, the fire of the people leaving Egypt. And it's also a picture of her being brought to then the mountain to worship. And what was burning on top was the fire. And what came on Pentecost? Tongues of fire on the heads of the people in the New Testament. So because they died on that day, they celebrate it with bonfires. And here's Lag Be'omer, a bittersweet time in Israel where they all come together and dance and sing around um, a bonfire of some sort. And it's also in, in some of the... Um, different groups of the Jewish people. Some are celebrating Rabbi Akiva and him having that dedication to continue on the Torah, to continue on the truth of God's word. 
And so you can see how that's bittersweet for some. And we as Christians then are responsible to take on that role and to continue to speak truth in a gentle, loving manner to a broken, fallen world, living in darkness without being regenerated, born again from the Holy Spirit. So I pray that during this time, you too will look at your life and say, am I, am I pleasing God or am I pleasing man? And what does it take to fill that void that I've been trying to fill with all kinds of things, the right people, power, possessions, money, playthings. I call them the P words, but they never satisfy. It's only when that void is filled with the very Spirit of God that we're born again spiritually and walk in newness of life. You'll never be the same. That happened to me July 23rd, 1973, and I've never looked back. So God bless you, Shalom Aleichem, and have a wonderful Sabbath. Shabbat Shalom. Bye-bye.